Hey squad, welcome back to the channel. My name is Mike and on today's episode, we finish our nervous system series with a deep dive look into neurogenic shock. Last week we dove into the body's feed and breed response known as the parasympathetic nervous system. So if you missed that video, click the eye above my head and check it out. With that said, let's dive in and get started. The first item we have to tackle is what exactly is shock? There will be a future video breaking down every aspect of shock, also known as hypoperfusion. However, for today, we define shock as a state of collapse and failure of the cardiovascular system, leading to the inability to maintain adequate circulation of blood flow to organs and tissues. When the tissues and organs do not receive adequate blood flow, the cells within them cannot maintain homeostasis due to a lack of oxygen, other nutrients, and waste removal. Before we continue, make sure to answer that question today in the comments below. Which cervical vertebrae contains the nerve root that controls the diaphragm? Very little statistical data has shown exactly how many cases of neurogenic shock occur each year in the United States, but estimates are around 12,000 cases per year. Almost 90% of those cases are caused by trauma to the brain or spinal cord. The most common location of trauma is to the cervical spine between C1 and the C7 vertebrae. This high cervical injury causes damage to the autonomic nervous system, more specifically the sympathetic nervous system. Remember the sympathetic nervous system roots originate from the T1 to L2 vertebrae whereas the parasympathetic nervous system roots from the brainstem and sacral portions of the spinal cord. Due to the location of damage high on the spinal cord, all sympathetic signals from the brain are now blocked, causing an unopposed parasympathetic nervous system to take over. This leads to catastrophic consequences. Now let's take a look at a diagram I learned many years ago that demonstrates neurogenic shock perfectly. The original video link to Khan Academy is in the video description below if you want to watch it later. Alright guys, let's take a look at this neurogenic shock diagram. Remember that we're dealing with an injury to the autonomic nervous system, okay? I'm going to use NS for nervous system during this. Um, and more specifically, we're looking at the sympathetic, okay, nervous system nervous system okay and remember when we're talking about the autonomic nervous system we have that yin and yang right we have the gas pedal which is that sympathetic nervous system but we also have that brake pedal the para sympathetic nervous system okay and all of these are going to play a function in neurogenic shock. Now remember, we are, we are injuring or severing the spinal cord in a significant enough manner at C1 through C7, okay? But the sympathetic nervous system is T1 through L2. Okay, so C1 and C7 are right above T1. So if we have an injury where the spinal cord is damaged enough that signals don't reach T1, the sympathetic nervous system ceases to exist. Okay, all of the, all of the neural signals that are going from the brain to these T1 through L2, uh, nervous system roots don't have any sympathetic messages okay all the messages that are getting through are the parasympathetic messages okay because remember these are from the brain stem okay many most there are some sacral uh, roots as well below the lumbar spine but the brain stem is where 90% of the information for the parasympathetic nervous system originates. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, what happens here? Okay, so the heart 
when we're in homeostasis and we have great perfusion and, and everything's working as it should, oxygen, nutrients, and other waste products are being given to the organs and taken away from the organs by the cardiovascular system. So the heart is giving blood rich in oxygen, rich in nutrients to the organs, which are then offloading all these waste product to the veins and they're transporting it back to the heart where then it can be recharged and go back and the whole process goes over and over and over. So why does the cardiovascular system collapse if you have a nervous system injury in the C1 through C7 um, area? And what happens is we lose the, let me change to white here just so you guys can really see, okay? You lose in that injury, you lose the ability for the nervous system to communicate via the sympathetic nervous system to the rest of the body, okay? It's still communicating to these, uh, to the heart and to organs and to vasculature via the parasympathetic nervous system, but it's no longer communicating via the sympathetic nervous system. So then what do you think happens, okay? The first thing that's going to happen is to the arteries and the veins themselves. The nervous system is there to create something called vascular tone, okay? The other version of this is sympathetic tone, okay? And all this is, these are exactly the same thing. All this is in layman's terms is it creates the tightness of the vasculature, okay? So we want tight vasculature so that blood doesn't pool, okay? It's free to move, it bounces, and it goes back down and it keeps moving forward until it reaches the organs. And then all the way through the venous system all the way back to the heart and the cycle goes around. So we want this tightness so that that blood can make it to where it needs to go. But now we have a loss of vascular tone because the sympathetic nervous system says, hey, let's constrict everything. But the parasympathetic says, dilate everything open. Okay. So without me having to erase a ton of stuff here, you're now going to get vessels, and I'm, I'm way over exaggerating this, but you're going to now get vessels that are large in size. Oop, drawing through everything, right? You're now getting vessels very large in size. That diameter of the cardiovascular vessels are going from something like this to something like this, okay? Now what's gonna happen is blood is not going to make it all the way across. It's just gonna pool and it's gonna sit there, right? And it's gonna sit down here as well. So if there's less blood coming back to the heart per cycle, what do you think we're gonna get? We're going to get our first symptom if we don't have enough stroke volume getting back to the heart, we are not getting enough stroke volume out of the heart and we're going to now get hypotension. Okay, so a decrease in their blood pressure. Okay, that's the first thing that we're gonna see. The second thing that we're going to see is because of this hypotension, typically the sympathetic, the sympathetic nervous system would jump in and say, hey, heart, beat faster. There's less blood, we need to move it quicker to keep up perfusion. But the parasympathetic nervous system is in charge right now. And it says, slow everything down. So instead of the heart speeding up the heart rate like it should, you're going to get 
a heart rate decrease, okay? And you're going to get bradycardia, okay? And that heart rate decrease is now going to make the hypotension worse because you're not moving as much blood as you should. So as heart rate decreases, blood pressure is also going to decrease. You can see why this becomes a whirlwind downwards. Okay, so as organs become hypoperfused or in that shock state, you're going to start seeing one very significant sign and that's AMS or altered mental status. You're gonna start seeing that confusion, okay? And this is because the organs, mainly the brain, don't get oxygen. They don't get the perfusion that they need and it's going to turn into an altered state of consciousness, that altered mental status. So that is a big sign with the other symptoms, the hypotension, the bradycardia, you're gonna start seeing altered mental status. Now we know with that possible injury that this is the road that the body's taking. We're in that shock state and it's only going to get worse as time goes on. The last thing that you are gonna see, and this kind of always confuses people, the, the big things that you're gonna see, is you're gonna start to see flushed and warm skin and you're like Mike they're in shock they should be you know pale cool clammy but why are they flushed and they're warm well solely because think about in typical shock think um, you know septic shock the sympathetic nervous system takes over and it says hey the skin doesn't need all of this blood. What needs it is the heart, lungs, and brain to fight this shock type symptom, or shock type um, environment. So it takes that blood from non-essential organs and it shifts it to the essential organs. But again, remember the sympathetic nervous system doesn't exist right now. The parasympathetic nervous system is not going to make that shift. It's going to keep it where uh, it was. It's gonna keep it in the digestive system. It's gonna keep it in the skin. It's gonna keep it in the reproductive system. It's not going to shift it to the heart, lungs, and brain like the body actually needs. So you're going to see that flushed and warm skin. I hope this, um, I really hope that this diagram uh, and this explanation helps you guys out. Uh, just remember everything that you're thinking, shock and sympathetic nervous system, think backwards because in this neurogenic shock, the parasympathetic nervous system is in full control. So guys, that's it for the nervous system. I hope you enjoyed this series and got something out of each and every video. Stay safe out there and I'll see you guys in the next video.